Part three, chapter nine of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part three, a voyage to Laputa, Balnibarbi, Lognag, Glubdub Drib, and Japan. Chapter Nine. The author returns to Maladonada, sails to the kingdom of Lugnag. The author confined. He is sent for to court. The manner of his admittance. The king's great lenity to his subjects. The day of our departure being come, I took leave of his highness, the governor of Glubdub Drib, and returned with my two companions to Maladonada, where, after a fortnight's waiting. A ship was ready to sail for Lugnag. The two gentlemen and some others were so generous and kind as to furnish me with provisions and see me on board. I was a month in this voyage. We had one violent storm and were under a necessity of steering westward to get into the trade wind, which holds for above sixty leagues. On the twenty first of April, seventeen o eight, we sailed into the river of Klimignig, which is a seaport town. At the southeast point of Lugnag, we cast anchor within a league of the town, and made a signal for a pilot. Two of them came on board in less than half an hour, by whom we were guided between certain shoals and rocks, which are very dangerous in the passage to a large basin, where a fleet may ride in safety within a cable's length of the town wall. Some of our sailors, whether out of treachery or inadvertence, Had informed the pilots that I was a stranger and great traveller. Whereof these gave notice to a custom house officer, by whom I was examined very strictly upon my landing. This officer spoke to me in the language of Alnibarbi, which, by the force of much commerce, is generally understood in that town, especially by seamen and those employed in the customs. I gave him a short account of some particulars. And made my story as plausible and consistent as I could, but I thought it necessary to disguise my country, and call myself a Hollander, because my intentions were for Japan, and I knew the Dutch were the only Europeans permitted to enter into that kingdom. I therefore told the officer, that having been shipwrecked on the coast of Balnibarbi and cast on a rock, I was received into Laputa or the Flying Island, of which he had often heard. And was now endeavouring to get to Japan, whence I might find a convenience of returning to my own country. The officer said, "I must be confined till he could receive orders from court, for which he would write immediately, and hope to receive an answer in a fortnight." I was carried to a convenient lodging with a sentry placed at the door. However, I had the liberty of a large garden, and was treated with humanity enough. Being maintained all the time at the king's charge, I was invited by several persons, chiefly out of curiosity, because it was reported that I came from countries very remote, of which they had never heard. I hired a young man who came in the same ship, to be an interpreter. He was a native of Lugnag, but had lived some years at Maldonada. And was a perfect master of both languages. By his assistance, I was able to hold a conversation with those who came to visit me, but this consisted only of their questions and my answers. The dispatch came from court about the time we expected. It contained a warrant for conducting me and my retinue to Trial Drag Dub, or Trill Drog Drib, for it is pronounced both ways as near as I can remember, by a party of ten horse. All my retinue was that poor lad for an interpreter, whom I persuaded into my service, and at my humble request, we had each of us a mule to ride on. A messenger was dispatched half a day's journey before us to give the king notice of my approach and to desire that his majesty would please to appoint a day and hour when it would, by his gracious pleasure, that I might have the honour to lick the dust before his footstool. This is the court style. And I found it to be more than matter of form, for upon my admittance two days after my arrival, 
I was commanded to crawl upon my belly and lick the floor as I advanced. But, on account of my being a stranger, care was taken to have it made so clean that the dust was not offensive. However, this was a peculiar grace, not allowed to any but persons of the highest rank, when they desire an admittance. Nay, sometimes the floor is strewed with dust on purpose, when the person to be admitted happens to have powerful enemies at court. And I have seen a great lord, with his mouth so crammed, that when he had crept to the proper distance from the throne, he was not able to speak a word. Neither is there any remedy, because it is capital for those, who receive an audience, to spit or wipe their mouths in His Majesty's presence. There is indeed another custom, which I cannot altogether approve of, when the king has a mind put any of his nobles to death in a gentle, indulgent manner, he commands the floor to be strewed with a certain brown powder of a deadly composition, which, being licked up, infallibly kills him in twenty-four hours. But, in justice to this prince's great clemency, and the care he has of his subjects' lives, wherein it were much to be wished that the monarchs of Europe would imitate him, it must be mentioned for his honour that strict orders are given to have the infected parts of the floor well washed after every such execution, which, if his domestics neglect, they are in danger of incurring his royal displeasure. I myself heard him give directions, that one of his pages should be whipped, whose turn it was to give notice about washing the floor after an execution, but maliciously had omitted it, by which neglect a young lord of great hopes, coming to an audience, was unfortunately poisoned, although the king at the time had no design against his life. But this good prince was so gracious as to forgive the poor page his whipping, upon promise that he would do so no more, without special orders. To return from this digression, when I had crept within four yards of the throne, I raised myself gently upon my knee, and then, striking my forehead seven times against the ground, I pronounced the following words, as they had been taught me the night before. Ink plain gloft throb, squat, serumbly hop, em lashnalt, zwin, t'snod balkifun, t'nod balkif, slinop had, griddlop, asht. This is the compliment, established by the laws of the land, for all persons admitted to the king's presence. It may be rendered into English thus. May your celestial majesty outlive the sun eleven moons and a half. To this the king returned some answer, which, although I could not understand, yet I replied, as I had been directed, Fluff drin yallaric, dwaldum prastad merpush, which properly signifies, My tongue is in the mouth of my friend. And by this expression was meant, that I desired leave to bring my interpreter, whereupon the young man already mentioned was accordingly introduced, by whose intervention I answered as many questions as His Majesty could put in above an hour. I spoke in the Balnabarbian tongue, and my interpreter delivered my meaning in that of Lugnag. The king was much delighted with my company, and ordered his Bliff Mark Club, or High Chamberlain, to appoint a lodging in the court for me and my interpreter, with a daily allowance for my table, and a large purse of gold for my common expenses. I stayed three months in this country, out of perfect obedience to His Majesty, who was pleased highly to favour me, and made me very honourable offers. But I thought it more consistent with prudence and justice, to pass the remainder of my days with my wife and family. End of Part 3 Chapter 9